welcome to Chapel Baptist Church's midweek service. We're thankful for each and every one of you that have taken the time to, to view our service. And we have one major praise that uh, we've been praying for for numerous weeks. We remember that Gene and Cal had the coronavirus. Well, they each tested negative for the coronavirus. So we praise the Lord that they are now through uh, the coronavirus. And so we just praise the Lord for that and how great God is in answering our prayers. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service today. Dearly Father, thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you so much for your healing hand that was upon the Cofelts. And we thank you so much for helping them through the ordeal of the coronavirus. We're thankful for each person that has attended our church. May you help each one with the needs that they have. And Father, may you bless each person that's viewing the video. And uh, we ask you to bless them in their circumstance right now. And Father, may we glorify you in all that we do, say, and think right now. I do pray. In Jesus' name.
turning to Psalm 34, if you have your Bible close to hand, Psalm 34. You might be thinking to yourself, why are we going to Psalm 34 if we're talking about we three kings, the life lessons from Saul, David, and Solomon? Well, the very fact is Psalm 34 is in direct connection with the passage we're actually dealing with in 1 Samuel 21. So notice with me the subtitle. Psalm 34, a psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. Verse number one, I will pray, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked upon him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Notice with me in verse number 18 now. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite. Spirit, let's ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, your kindness, the very fact that you hear us when we are in trouble. And Father, we thank you so much for the time that we could spend in your word today. And may you bless each person that's watching by way of video. And may you help us to know you better. Help us to love you most. May you bless this message, I do pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Think about with me a time where you could say to yourself, I am lost. Now, what I'm not talking about being lost is the, the fact of our condition before salvation, that of being lost, and, and the very fact that I am lost, I'm a sinner, I deserve the wrath of God. I'm not really speaking of that. I'm thinking of directions that somehow, some way. You got on the wrong roads. You have gotten off the beaten path. And you are now officially lost. Lost in direction. Lost in where you need to go. You know you have a goal as to where you need to go. But yet you are oblivious to the fact of how to get there. I love what we have today is that of a GPS. A, a global positioning system. That it takes you where you are. And it tells you how to get to where you're going. Sometimes you are in ar argument with the GPS at times because it likes to speak to you. And it could be whatever you program it to be, whether it be an Australian, uh, whether it be a British person, whether it be male or female, it doesn't matter. But a lot of times, if the GPS is not quite what it's supposed to be because of differences of construction or whatever, it might be a useless piece of technology. And other people in a later in a latter generation would say, well, that's why you have maps and you can read maps. A lot in my generation don't doesn't know how to read maps well and we would be lost. I remember one time specifically that I did not have a GPS with me. My cell phone was not capable of doing the Google Maps, and so I did not have a map with me, but I thought I knew where I was supposed to go. I was supposed to go downtown to Orlando. I was, with, I was supposed to be with my uh, South Lake managers and, and doing some sort of uh, presentation with them uh, to this, this board, this company by which they were a part of. And so I thought I knew where I was going. I was by myself, and I did not get off on the right exit. And so I got off the wrong one. And then I got off on another wrong one. And I got off on another wrong one. So ultimately, I found myself pulling into a strip mall, saying to myself, I have no idea how to get to where I'm supposed to be going. Maybe I could get out of this presentation and uh, text my director and say, hey, do you really, really need me to be there? And of course, she texts back, yes, yes, absolutely. You need to come. Okay, I don't know how to get there. And so I called my wife, 
and uh, she said, okay, where are you? And I gave her uh, where I was, the different signs that were, were around me. She looked it up on MapQuest, and she said, wow, you are really out of the way. It's going to take, I think, 45 minutes to get back to where you're supposed to go. And so she gave me directions. I got back on the right path, and eventually I got there. I was an hour late from the time I was supposed to be there, but it was okay because the presentation wasn't until the end of the day. So, but yet a lot of times we are just like that, that we think we know where we're going. We think we're doing it just fine, but then we come to the word of God and then it convicts us from where we are now, where we're supposed to be over here, and we need to get right with God. A lot of times in our Christian walks, if we're not careful, we tend to slide and slide backwards we do. Whether it be that of your prayer life, whether it be that of your Bible reading, whether it be that of just being faithful to church. And I know that, that the reason why you're viewing this is probably because you're not able to come at 2 o'clock where we have our midweek service, or you're, you're not able to come because you're not comfortable coming out because of the coronavirus and everything going along with that. I totally understand that. Uh, but yeah, if you're faithful in viewing the videos, we really appreciate that. But yeah, a lot of times we can slide backwards, and if we're not careful, we slide away from where God wants us to be. So David is a perfect example at times. I, I love the Bible in that it doesn't sugarcoat anything about the major characters in the Bible. It doesn't say how great of every single person that you meet in the Bible, how great they are, but rather it shows their downfalls as well. David here is going to have a downfall from where he's at. If you remember from last week, David is running away from Saul to save his own life. Over and over again, we saw Saul try to kill David. Ever since those women were saying, Saul have killed his thousands, David is ten thousands. Then he has been a target from King Saul. He's been eyed by King Saul. And that many times, King Saul has been having this evil spirit come upon him. And normally what happens is David gets his harp. He plays his, his, his good music for him. That evil spirit goes away. And then everything is good. Well, at this point in time, that evil spirit's come upon King Saul. He's hearing David play. He's getting angry and angry because it's David that's playing. And he takes his javelin and throws it at him. David gets out of the way. Not once. Not twice. But three times. Wow. Saul tries to kill David by using his servants. And Jonathan overhears. Jonathan corrects his thinking. Saul goes back to being good with David. But then... Unfortunately, he sends messengers to the house where David lives. Michael somehow knew this and told him, if you don't leave tonight, you're going to die in the morning. So he leaves. She makes up a story about him. And then he goes with the prophets. And then eventually he tells Jonathan, Jonathan, your father's trying to kill me again. No, 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 no. He would have told me. Well, as we saw last week, David is now on the run from King Saul for no good reason. He is now in a the part of Israel's most wanted right now. And he is running for his life. Turn with me now to 1 Samuel chapter 21. Because he is running for his life, he makes some bad decisions that will affect other people. Anytime that we make bad decisions, we do affect other people around us, whether it be family members, whether it be friends, whether it be church members, whatever it might be. It's the very fact that our decisions about God, and whether we're walking with Him or not, will greatly affect those who we are closest to. And here, David is running for his life. He's not making wise decisions, and it costs people their lives. Verse number 1 of chapter 21, we see that David goes specifically to the, the, the tabernacle to talk with the priests. Verse number 1, then came David to, no, to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid of, at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone and no man with thee? 
Notice what David says. He doesn't tell him the truth, but he tells him a lie. Verse number two. And David said unto Ahimelech, the priest, The king hath made, commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. So he makes up a story about what King Saul wants him to do. He says, okay, I'm on a secret mission from King Saul. He has sent me away to a certain place to meet up with a band of men in order to do and accomplish Saul's will. Is that the truth? No. No, it's not. David needs supplies and he makes up a story about what King Saul wants him to do. In fact, what King Saul really wants David to do is to die. What King Saul really wants David to do is for him to come back to the palace and for him to kill him. And so he makes up a story and tells the people whom is the closest to God, the priests, those who are picked, selected specifically from all the families of Israel to be the priests of God, he tells them a lie. Oh, that's not good, David. That's a bad decision. Verse number three, he asked for bread. Now, therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand. Or what is there present? So he asked for loaves. And verse number four, the priest said, answered David and said, There is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread. If the young men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us. Notice that. About these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So David lies again. So first he lies about his mission. He says, Saul has has told me to go to a certain place, but yet I have run in haste so that I don't even have food. I don't have anything for the people that I meet to go and do this mission from King Saul, so I need bread. The priest answered, well, I don't have any common bread. I have holy bread. I have hallowed bread. I have the show bread that is in the temple that's supposed to be for the priests. And he says, as long as you and the young men that you're going to go with as long as you've kept yourself from women for three days, you, you can have it. And David reassures, yes, the men have kept themselves. I have kept myself. We have kept ourselves from that for three days. Question, who is he meeting? No one. Okay. Has he kept himself from women? Yes, that's absolutely true. But the fact is that he's making up a story about people that he's going to meet, and that is not true. And so, verse 6, the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. So not only do you lie about your mission, you lied about the men that you're with, and that now you just need bread, and you get holy bread... That was supposed to be for the priest given to you specifically, David, because you lied about your situation. That's not a good situation. Then notice with me about verse number 8, he asked for a weapon. And David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. Once again, David lied about his mission. He says, King Saul has commanded me to go and meet uh, some men in a certain place. Okay, do you have any food? Yes, you have holy food, as long as everybody's been kept, kept away from women. Yeah, everybody's kept themselves from women because there's no one there that I'm meeting. But he doesn't tell them that. And so he says, okay, well, I need a weapon now because the, the mission that I'm on re involves haste. So I, I had to leave all my weapons behind. So is there anybody that has a weapon around here? And verse number 9, And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the, the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If, there, if thou wilt take that, take it. For there is no other save that here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it me. Now remember, David has used Goliath's sword once before. After he... He flung his stone 
and it went and it sunk into the Goliath's forehead. Goliath went forward, and in order to finish the job, make sure that Goliath could not get back up, he takes Goliath's sword and takes care of that Goliath that was in his life. And so, we have a sword that if it's, if it's proportioned to a giant, it would be very heavy. It would be very big. And so, I don't know if this is a good idea, David. We actually don't know if he ever uses this sword during battle. If he does, then he must be bigger than what we think, but yet not as big as a 10-foot giant. And so it's an impractical weapon for David to have. And with that, it's, it's an interesting choice, Goliath's sword. But understand this, his choices have consequences. Verse number 7, now, there, now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. And notice this, his name was Doeg, an Edomite, the chiefest of the herdmen that belonged to Saul. So Saul had a servant there by the name of Doeg. He, were, Doeg would then go to Saul and tell him exactly what he saw. When David is now a vigilante, he tells Saul, David was with the priests, and the priests helped him. The priests will come before King Saul. They will answer the charge of helping a known criminal in the land of Israel. And the priest would say, we didn't know what he was after. We didn't know that he was a vigilante from you. We didn't know he was your enemy because he made up this story about what you sent him to do. And now we are in trouble. Have, have mercy. And he would not have mercy. And he had Doeg the Edomite kill all the priests. There is one that would escape. And he would later join up with David. And David said, I will protect you because you are the last one. He's responsible for the death of those priests. Anytime that we're away from God, we cause other people harm. But not only that, but we cause ourselves harm as well. We see that in verse number 10, David goes to a specific place that that could have been the end of David. Verse number 10 and David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. Think about the well-known people that are, were from Gath. How many do you know of? Only one. Now two, with Achish, the king. But the one that we knew from Gath was that of Goliath. So picture with me. David is going before the king of Gath. He's going to the enemies of God for for refuge, for protection. He goes to the very wrong one. He goes to the king of Gath. A well-known giant killer is in the midst of a place where Bolt was born the giant. And not only that, he, what, he, what is he carrying with him? Goliath's massive sword. So not only are you the giant killer that was from the place that you're now at, that you're in before, before the king, of that place, you have Goliath's sword, which you used to kill that giant that was from that place, and that sword is very recognizable being Goliath's sword. This is not good for David. Not a wise decision at all. Notice with me, though, in verse 11, And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands. So right off the bat, they recognize who David is and tells the king of Gath who he is. And interesting enough, they mistaken David to be the king of Israel. Now, no, remember that David acted more like a king than Saul did at this point in time because Saul made him to go out to battle and to come in in victory. To go out in battle and to come in in victory. And that is exactly Saul's main job to do as the king. And so they equated David as the king of Israel. And then they said, well, wasn't it noted by this person, by the women, that Saul had killed his thousands and David his ten thousands? 
Now, who are the ten thousands? Who is the only group of people that David has gone against time after time after time after time, winning the wars against them? And that is the Philistines. The exact group of people that he is before. Hearing all these different things about David, and now David is within their grasp. The known giant killer from the place that David is now standing. He has the giant sword with him that killed the giant from that place. And now, not only that, but he has killed so many Philistines. So many Philistines that were coming against Israel. He killed them by leading a band of men against them. And he always was the victor. And so, verse 12, David understands all this. And David laid up his, these words in his heart, and he and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them, and feigned himself mad, that's crazy, insane, in their hands, and scrabbled on the door of the gate, and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see that the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of madmen, that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence, shall this fellow come into my house? So right off the bat, he knows that he's in the wrong place because uh, it's the king of Gath. Not only that, but these men put two and two together and say, this is David. If we kill him, then we get rid of our main problem. Uh-oh, my life is in danger. So what does David do? He acts as crazy as possible in order for them to get him away. And then right after that, he comes to his senses and then gets right where he's supposed to be. In verse number 1 of chapter 22, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all of his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. He went back to his family. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves to, unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. So he now has a band of men, a band of soldiers that are ready for battle that God prepares for him. Now, understand that these are not the best of men. They're in distress. They're in debt. They're discontented. These are not the ones that you would really pick to be your choice people, choice soldiers in the midst of battle. But these are the ones that God had for him. And then David took care of his family, verse number three. And David went thence to Mizpah, of Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you till I know what God will do for me. Remember, who is David's relatives? Back away, it's that of Ruth the Moabite. She gets married to Boaz. Boaz has a son, Obed. Obed has a son, Jesse. Jesse has a son, David. And so they are actually relatives to that of Moab, and so he goes to the king of Moab and asks for refuge for his family members, specifically his father and his mother, and he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the hold. And not only that, but God then sends word to David through the prophet of Gad, prophet Gad. And the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hold, depart and get thee into the land of Judah, then David departed and came into the forest of Hareth. So along these lines, David had some missteps. He had some bad directions about what he did and exactly who he went to for help. He would always be in danger. He endangered the priest's lives. He endangered his own life by going to the Philistines. And now he gets right by going back to his own land to his own family, and then takes care of his family, takes care of everything around him, and then hears from God, and, and God tells him exactly where to go. From this part, we have the psalm that we read in the beginning, Psalm 34. Turn over there with me. Psalm 34. And notice with me what he said that he did. It says that is the time when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. You might say, well, that's a different name than Achish, the king of Gath. Abimelech here is simply a title that Philistines would use for a king. So since the king of Gath is a king, Achish by name, he would have this title of Abimelech. It would be like that of Pharaoh, 
being the king of Egypt. You have different names with him, like Ramses. So it would be very similar to that. And so David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continue to be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord. Why can he say all of this? How can he say that he will magnify the Lord together? He said, verse 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked upon him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him and deliver them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Notice when they, verse 18, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saith such as be of a contrite spirit. We, we're going to notice that throughout David's life, when David gets off where he's supposed to be, where he's gone away from where he's supposed to be at, what direction he's supposed to go, when he's away from that, when he comes to himself, he always has a contrite heart. He has a humbled heart, and he looks to God for guidance. He looks to God for helping him to get out of the situation that he put himself in, and God delivers him out of that, out of that trouble, out of that fears, out of that place that he is at. How about us? None of us are anointed king of Israel like David was. Uh, none of us are in the place where da David is, that we willingly went to the enemies of God. But yet many times we can find in our own lives that we have walked away from God, that we have backslid from where we're supposed to be to where we're at right now. And if we are in a place that we're not supposed to be, here's what I want you to do. Have a broken and contrite heart knowing that you're not where you're supposed to be. And then confess your sin to God. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Get right with God. And then decide today to walk with God closer. Closer and closer with God. God says, if you draw nigh to me, I will draw nigh to you. So if we ever find ourselves in this condition, we need to repent, we need to confess, we need to get right with God and walk with Him daily. I hope this has been an encouragement to you, and uh, let's ask the Lord's blessing on our dismissal. Dear Holy Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your kindness to us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now we can walk with you daily, we can be and do what you want us to do, and we ask you to help us, each one of us, to be right with you. Help us to walk with you closer and closer in our hearts to you. And if there's anything in our lives that hinders our relationship with you, may you help us to get rid of it, eliminate it, or to limit it in such a degree that it doesn't have power over us anymore. Father, may you bless our dismissal now, I do pray. All this in Jesus' name.